Here's my uh, co-host. At the end is my son, Joel Adams, who is a... He was an animation designer. He worked uh, for the, he did the uh, designs of the characters for the first four years of King of the Hill, um, and won a co co won an Emmy for that, designing those characters. Uh, Joel, unfortunately, is a very good artist, and of course, the King of the Hill sucked art wise. It's <laughs> a good show. So I would ask Joel how he could possibly go to work every day designing these characters since they're drawn so badly. He said, don't worry about it, Dad. Before I leave the house in the morning, I slam the door in my hand. <laughs> Ow. Ow, right. He's also designed uh, characters for uh, uh, The Mask, um, uh, The Hulk, uh, Cartoon Show, and uh, uh, so NASCAR. Thank you, thank you. NASCAR. He also has his own characters called Lils. And it draws naked ladies too, which I am totally ashamed of. It. <laughs> there you go. This is Buzz Adams. <laughs> Just to explain this, um, which I don't necessarily do, can, is his name is Aldrin Aw. Okay, Aldrin Aw. Now, if somebody is named Aldrin, you're going to think Buzz Aldrin, right? Thinking Buzz Aldrin, you're going to give him a nickname, and you're going to call him Buzz. So Buzz, <laughs> is now called Buzz. Okay. Now, Buzz travels with us to different conventions and hangs out with us because he's a nice guy. So people assume, for some reason, that he's an Adams. <laughs> <laughs> so they will actually buy tickets on airplanes for him for Buzz Adams. Then of course he has to show his ID. <laughs> Not so good. So Buzz is a tremendously uh, talented artist who is a fan favorite. He started, I don't know where he started, he, but he did draw Bamberella uh, magazine. Then also other comic books, he'll tell you if you ask him. And uh, he, he's become a fan favorite because, uh, well, Buzz, if you ask him to do a, a little sketch, he'll do you a complicated sketch and be beautiful and wonderful and then show it to your friends and everybody will go, ooh, and then call Buzz to do more commissions, which is what he counts on. Uh, he does comic books often and uh, on and off, and if you need to know any, he's also an encyclopedia of comic books. He knows more than anybody here does, maybe except for you. I don't know. Um, uh, we can talk to you about anything because we we uh, we uh, cross the generations. I know everything about yesterday and today, and he, they know everything about today, and they know nothing about yesterday except for Buzz, who is a historian. Has that. So I don't want to tell you about all the evils that men do in comic books because if you ask me, I will tell you. But I don't want to just launch into it with all this evil crap that we do in comic books. And things have changed and become so wonderful today that I think they should be much more interested in today. But knowing you and seeing the gray hairs, <laughs> you will probably ask these old damn questions. Okay? So we will call. <laughs> we will call upon you and then we will launch into stories. And we will tell, just like, are there any kids here? Every once in a while we use a dirty word. I'm just saying that ahead of time. Okay? Yes. Okay, so we're going to start with you. So I was going to ask what you're working on Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm working on a, uh, a six issue miniseries of uh, Superman and uh, um, Jack Kirby's New Gods. I assume that uh, I assume that everybody agrees that uh, anybody who's handled Jack Kirby's new bet since Jack Kirby has kind of fucked them up. <laughs> Again, I said I apologize for the first word, uh, and I hope that I will not. I do not intend to. Uh, at a convention recently, I had uh, Mr. Michael Golden, who some of you may recognize, uh, come up to me and say, "Neil, those Jack Kirby uh, figures that you're doing, I should do those." I said, "Well, cool." 
So I will pencil some, and, and Michael Golden will be pitching in to help me. Buzz may help me as well. I've got two volunteers to take the heavy work off my shoulders, but everybody wants to draw Jack Kirby characters. And Jack Kirby, eyes, big, chunky, awful teeth, and stuff like that. So we all want to do it, you know. So I'll let him make, I'll let them make some stuff. And uh, also in the in the story, I'm all in, also introducing three new Supermen. <laughs> from Krypton? Well, they're not from Krypton, they're from the bottle city of Candor. Whatever happened to that bottle city? Does, it, huh, does anybody know about Nibiru? No, I do Okay. On the, <laughs> on the other side of the sun? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's, why, that's why we can't see it, because it's on the other side of the sun. That's actually an old theory. Uh, we used to play with that, and I used to, when I was a kid, I would read, kid, I used to read uh, science fiction stories about that planet on the other side of the sun in 1957, 1956, when I was a little kid, going from Anyway, uh, the idea is that there's a planet on the other side of the sun that now the, the geeks and crazies are calling the guru, and uh, what a perfect place for the bottle city of Candor, people, now that they're no longer the bottle. And also, what a nice place for apocalypse. <coughs> Gee, what if they both want the planet? Uh, wouldn't that be good? What if Darkseid wanted it? Mm -hmm. So, that's sort of the basics, basis of the story. So I'm gonna have a lot of fun for six issues. I'm, I'm up to the second issue, and I guess when I finish this, they'll schedule it, so then we'll all see where, where it goes. Anybody else? Question? Yes. Are there any Favorite stories about working in Marvel or DC in the 70s? Yeah. Favorite stories that why? Um, working on DC and Marvel in the 70s. Everything I did was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Um, Next. Working <laughs> and drawing stories wise. Uh, my question to you, Neil, is uh, I truly respect you back in the 70s. How you represented Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Okay, stop it. <laughs> stop it. How, how, okay, okay. how you and Jerry and Jerry Robinson did a fantastic job. Yes, we of did. Great and bring justice back to Jerry Siegel yes, and Joe Schuster. Yes. And I, I will really appreciate. I always heard Jerry Robinson's side. And will you please? I'd love to hear your side. Everything that Jerry said is true. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> we won. They lost. Too bad. <laughs> You know, like I, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a twice told tale, and the truth is that they were jerks, and we fixed them, and they're not jerks anymore. Hey, different jerks. I, I like to ask you, is there, is there anything out there that, that you want to work on that you haven't worked on yet? You, usually, when something like that happens, they give it to me, and I do it. So, I mean, name something. Yeah, see, huh? yeah. I get to do it. You know what happened when I. You guys don't actually notice this, but I've been out of the business for a long time. My son will tell you that um, uh, one of the ways to get your kids through kids through college is to not draw comics, <laughs> but to do advertising. Pays a lot more money. Joel, do you have uh, any tuition loans you have to pay? No. No. None of the kids do. And the reason for that is that advertising pays better than comic books. And so doing advertising is how I you know, earn my money. Now it's a little bit easier. Now I'm back to comic books because one, the business has gotten better. We can earn more money. Each of us make a decent living. We can pay for our, where we live. We don't have to live in our parents' home. <laughs> I'm just saying it's like, it's a, it's a good business. So I'm back and I'm back for the duration plus six. You know what I mean? I'm here. So. Really, there's no limits to what I'm going to be doing. So I'm going to be doing my, the characters that we did for continuity. Uh, so far since I came back, I did uh, Batman Odyssey. I did uh, First X-Men. Yeah. And, and now I'm doing uh, Superman. I, I don't think you can shoot higher than that. I mean, they don't want to give me a, a cheesy characters like, uh, I'm trying to think of a cheesy character. <laughs> uh, they don't want to give me a cheesy character because they can't pay me as much to do that because then the you know if I save it then it'll take too long and they, and they don't want to pay me for that. They say, well if we're gonna pay you all this money, Neil, we need you to do be doing important characters. 
So I might convince them that there's some really crappy character out there that I can turn into a giant superhero. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I might be able to do that. I'm thinking about it. You know, like, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the, I think his name is Bullion or something. He's a, it's, it's a DC character that's Booster Gold. I'm thinking Booster Gold. You know? Let's turn Booster Girl Gold into a major superhero. Sort of like Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> do you guys know why they do why they did Guardians of the Galaxy? I don't know, but it was a lot of fun. Wasn't it a lot of fun? You know why they did it? Yeah. Because they had no other characters. Because they mixed them all out to other That's right. That's all they had left. Guardians of Crappy Galaxy. A tree and a vomit monkey in outer space. Free from tree. <laughs> yes. So um, this question is for you guys, um, you both worked in animation as well as in the books. Mm -hmm. Which do you like better and why? <clears throat> um, he's done more animation work than I have. I've done more comic book work, work and yes, I used to do JSA for DC and <clears throat> Vampirella for Harris and I've done some uh, independent work as well. Um, I hated doing all of them. I did. It, that was when you are on the other side of the table and you know, as you're, you're a fan and reading the stories and such, I mean, it's a lot more fun and you can't, you have to be a fan first to even want to attempt to become the creator. Um, I was unhappy with, artistically, with what I was producing because, and I realized I can do what Neil does or what a lot of other more prolific artists do without sacrificing some of my work and it's uh, too slow and I'm too, too much of a stickler with my own work to complete stuff in time to do a monthly book. Mm -hmm. So I got into advertising afterward. Uh, that allows me to pay for my, you know, take care of my bills and such that I can still stay in the comic business. You know, keep one foot in there and still be the geek with the fan. But my output since then has been more, um, been more happy with the projects, were, uh, they were given more, um, a better deadline, more flexible time for me to complete the work but to a stage where I'm happy. So that has been something that I'm uh, happy with. Joel? Uh, kind of the same thing. Comic books is a lot of work and not a lot of money. And uh, I got involved in animation and licensing where the, you know, the work was a lot easier. Uh, I, like the, I like the ability in, um, animation license to switch things up all the time because if you get off one project and move on to another, I have to draw differently again. You know, the next project draw differently, draw next draw differently. I, I like the, the variety of things that I can do, the styles I can play with, projects I can be involved in, uh, and licensing. I work on everything from the Incredible Hulk animated series to the Harry Potter movies, you know, the licensing and packaging art for that. So, I, I, I and got paid so much better than a lot of us comic book guys get for pages and stuff. And for doing one figure, I'll get what a lot of guys get for a page. So it's it made it that much more entertaining and easier to do. What was your what was about your best weekly rate? Um, my I was probably I was working on the, the NASCAR racer show, and at the same time I was working on I, I don't know if I want to say numbers, but at, at, on NASCAR races I was probably making about twenty five hundred a week. And then I was doing, at night, I was doing licensing for Power Rangers, NASCAR, and a show called Las Luchadoras. So I was, I was doing double time and just making stupid money. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make that kind of money in comic books. Nope. I mean, if you're paid, if you're paid, uh, if you're lucky and paid $400 a page, you can do five pages a week. Maybe. That's tough. That's tough compared to this stuff. You can't raise a family easily. I mean, and that's working really, really, really hard. This is triple that, easily. And I get approached by a lot of aspiring young artists that shows, who wants to show me their work, and review the portfolio and ask me uh, how they should break into the business. And I try to discourage them. Because I want them to understand, first of all, I ask the question, like, why? If you don't have an answer for why, then you shouldn't even approach this. Best-selling comics, now these days. If a comic book sells 50,000 copies, it breaks top 10. 
about 10, 15 years ago, the book was selling 50,000 copies, it was getting canceled. And most of the royalties with the companies for books starts at 50,000. So the first 50,000, all the money goes to the company. And then, you know, every issue afterward, you get a certain percentage of the cover price. So if a book is selling only 45,000, you're only getting page rate and nothing else, okay? And they can't really afford to pay good rates anymore because like Neil, somebody, a legend like Neil can, you know, garner a good page rate. But a regular Joe, um, if the book is not selling well, they can't really afford to pay you good rates. So Marvel and DC, they're outsourcing a lot of the artwork to the Philippines, to the, uh, um, you know, South America and Europe because they have artists, young artists, who will work for 50 bucks, 100 bucks a page, and we can't live on that. So a lot of the American artists are being overlooked and ignored because they just couldn't afford to pay us. But they can get a, a slew of, you know, there's a lot of vowels in those last names, <laughs> all the artists, you know, and they have one or two agencies that represent them all, and you know, it's like a farm. You know, so that's what's happening in the comic books on the other side. So you can't really make a look at it, you know, living, doing comics anymore. But you can, if you create your own work, uh, a 50,000 issue comic book, really 50,000 people are not reading the comic because, you know, the stores order more than they need for the shelf life. So you're, you're, you're looking at about maybe 25,000, maybe 20,000 people that the book is reaching. A good web comic, you can get 10,000 hits a day if it's really good, and those are really people reading this stuff. So a lot of people are not even relying on the, you know, the big two, and they're doing their own stuff. So their readership is slowly dropping, and the the material that they're producing aren't really, you know, attracting more. Movies help, the games help, the books themselves. In fact, we're talking about one point the other day about Deadpool the character. The character is tremendously popular. The book sales suck, you know, and they're like, I can't find a connection. The books should be selling in the hundred thousands if the popular character is this popular. But it just, the character became popular from the fandom without any support from the book. People like the character without even ever reading the comic. If they make them, so this is another uh, property the Marvel has that they can, you know, create into a movie and franchise and make a lot of money and will have zero effect on the sale of the comic. You know, so it's, that's what's happening. On the other hand, we have five fingers. <laughs> on, the <table. laughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, the business has become entrepreneurial in that people are going going in different directions to do books. There are, for example, uh, good realistic artists that are drawing cartoony style to do uh, Adventure Time. Uh, there are people who are doing independent projects that they are actually selling and getting some licensing on. People are trying different methods and different means of doing things. They're also bargaining a little bit more with the companies to get a better rate when the, when the, when the companies lie to them. Dissemination of information in spite of the companies is greater than it ever was. Also, artists get their artwork back, and they get their artwork back and they can sell it, so they can double their money if they're lucky or if they're good. Um, they have agents selling it, so they don't have to do it themselves, so they can sell it on the internet. They participate in, uh, in uh, licensing, do artwork for licensing. They participate in, other, in outside projects. People come to artists all the time with outside projects. They come to Buzz mm -hmm. for, with outside projects, and they pay them better. They'll pay better Buzz better for an outside project than the company will because, first of all, you're not doing Captain America. You're doing this outside project, so you're going to have to charge more money because you're not, you, don't, you can't uh, afford to be part of the gamble. So there's all these interesting things that artists are doing, and they're doing other things. Uh, the, the things that you, you also forget, one easily forgets, is that a good artist, when his stuff is out there, is available to his local community, whether it's a city or even a locality, let's like say Westport, Connecticut, or whatever, to do advertising. So advertising clients come to them, whereas 20 years ago, nobody came to a comic book artist to do advertising. And they were considered to be junk artists. Now they're considered with respect. Very often, an artist, even though he's doing regular, 
feature can be doing more, can be making more money doing outside stuff than he is doing that feature. So there's a lot of variety in, in what is going on and ways for individuals to make money. You'll, the, any conversation that you have with an, with an individual, other artist, will tell you how he's doing other things that he's not doing. Oh, and you go, oh, that's interesting. I have an internet comic book as well as my regular comic book work. Really, are you making any money off that? Well, I'm starting to. You, you just don't know what you're gonna run into, and the opportunities are fantastic. First of all, the internet has made it better, also made communications better, so the opportunity to do new and different things has become much more varied. And so, you know, yeah, it's, it's always, you know, we can look at it in a negative way, but the truth is that uh, the income over uh, the last several decades has quadrupled plus. Uh, I, when I was doing comic books, before I left comic books, you, you, don't, you sort of don't remember, when did Neil leave comic books? I left comic books, more or less, regular DC and Marvel comic books, right after I did Superman versus Muhammad Ali. Then I there was a publisher and I did other stuff but I didn't, and I did covers, and I did stuff here and there. But at that time, that Superman versus Muhammad Ali book, which is probably the best project I ever worked on up to recently, I was paid $55 a page. I came back doing Batman Odyssey. They paid me, and you don't tell me this. <laughs> okay, I, I'm now paid $1,000. How many, how many That's why I became an Adams, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. How has it changed now that the like DC is owned by uh, you know, big movie company, Marvel's owned by Disney? Has that changed the aspect? Of the we keep searching for changes. Would you say <laughs> we keep on looking for changes? We don't see many changes. Yeah, everybody's moving to California. How about that? Um, that, that puts some people out of work, but usually it's guys whose wives make more money than they do. <laughs> Just saying. Um, uh, beyond that, the editorial control doesn't seem to be there. There's a certain, we have a certain suspicion that maybe the mother companies think that the comic book companies know what they're doing because Marvel is making better movies than DC Comics. In fact, DC Comics movies suck. But Marvel Comics, Marvel movies are great. They're fantastic, and not even if they're Marvel. But the, the editorial control that Marvel is exerting on the movies is making them into better movies. Well, they have sympathetic directors, but those same directors have written comic books. You're talking Josh. I'm talking Josh Wheaton, of course. I <laughs> you can't find a more sympathetic director than Josh. So we, we're, we're not seeing, uh, we're seeing that this curiosity, maybe we know what we're talking about, you know, maybe we're not a bunch of idiots in a room. So I, I don't know, we, I don't, you know, we have conversations all the time about it. Are they, is this Marvel screwing up or is it, is Disney, you have this thing about Disney, it's like they're like an ogre. Everybody thinks well, since Walt died, Disney has become a monster or maybe even before Walt died. And we keep on looking for those things, and we keep on, you know, we'll take an example, what seems to be an example, and it won't necessarily bear out. So maybe they're not monsters. Maybe they don't, you know, maybe they're not bigots. Maybe everybody's not gay. I mean, <laughs> just saying. It just seems like, you know, all the things that we've, we've been suspicious about are not necessarily true. And Warners, uh, they just seem to walk around banging their heads on them. <laughs> I have no idea what the hell those guys are doing. I like the DC movies. You like DC movies? Like the last Superman movie? Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. You like when the dogs stayed in the car? I don't like the athlete casting, but I like the man. I like Superman doing some super What about Robin and Jerome? You like that one? Well, I liked it in Dark Knight Returns, but who remembers that? Dark Knight Returns <laughs> wasn't, wasn't, wasn't that the They're shoehorning the Dark Knight Returns into the next Superman movie. It's a little hard. Don't you think yeah. it's a little hard that they're, they're, they're taking uh, Frank Miller's 65-year-old Batman and shoving it backward into the movie? Yeah. <coughs> it just seems very odd to me. I, I understand the themes, but, you know, Robin is a girl. I don't, 
that the problem I have with the DC problem. And Wonder Woman is no ass. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem I see with the DC problem is that Marvel had one cogent cinematic universe, and that's they waited, they were patient, and they built it. DC can't make up their mind. They want to have a cinematic universe, but meanwhile, they have a watered down version of their characters on TV. You know, you can't have two. They just premiered Flash, and they just announced the guy who's going to play Flash in the movie version. I'm like, guys, you know, take it from some, something like Marvel's not hiding their formula. It's showing you, hey, this is how it works. Just follow it. It's okay, you know? No, they'll find a way to screw themselves up. There's too many cooks in the kitchen, you know, and none of them know how to cook. <laughs> you know, and somebody make one decent sandwich, and everybody else wants to, you know, deconstruct it. Carol. Give Joss Wheaton a big check. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I do like the name Buzz Adams, but it sounds like a Shazam villain. <laughs> Got this already. Right. <laughs> well, lightning bolt. Uh, that does stupid do hair. <laughs> Tintin. Which we're learning to love for no reason I can explain. Yes. Do you think with DC's domination over both the animation format and they're very quickly moving to dominate television as well, do you think that poisons them to make bigger moves? We don't understand how they could be so smart doing that stuff and so dumb with the movies. Yeah. How they, how, what's the deal? They had they had Smallville, now they have Arrow, uh, now they have uh, uh, Gotham, now they got Flash. It seems like through. they're doing it all right in the movies, you know? Superman goes off and has a bastard son. I, I, I don't get it, you know? It kills the bad guy. Does that make sense? How about putting your, your hand in front of his face? <laughs> I'm just saying. thing get attached to the back of his head so that only when he moves his head do his eyes go like this. Why doesn't he just go like this? And try those people if that's what he wants to do. I don't get it. I don't get any of that stuff. Dog stays in the car, family gets out. I never saw a dog like that in my life. He's always out of the car, running around in a circle, waiting for the family to get out. Never stays in the car. It's okay, son. You could have let your those all those kids die. Might, maybe that would have been a better decision. Are you crazy? Yeah. Stupid stuff. Don't take advice from this man. <laughs> let your kids drown and himself. Stupid. Movie. I'm sorry. I loved it. The Avengers. <laughs> the Avengers, fantastic. And the Guardians of the Galaxy. From the dumbest comic book ever. Oh, it's the best movie ever. That's one thing I agree. It, I had so much fun going to the film. You have very little expectation. Yeah, yeah. So you went in and everything was out. No, again, this thing was good. Yes. Yeah, a tree and a moment in outer space. Beautiful. <laughs> yes, yes. Then why isn't Shield better? <laughs> I'm just saying. Michael Chandler was great on it. Oh, yeah, she had it maybe in five seasons, it'll be halfway decent. I'm just saying. If it gets canceled, I'm going to blame you. Me personally, they had to convince me to watch the DC stuff on TV. I hate a small bill. The 40 year old high school student. <laughs> Yeah, they're like, get over it. Plus, every the time they shout the machine, it's like two people in a room talking. Everything's on medium shot. I hated that too, you know? But Arrow grew on me because he put a gun to my head. Watch. <laughs> I'm your pops in the Aladdin show. <laughs> yeah. You know, having dinner with Money Bennett, right? That kind of, I have to watch it. I am not watching Spartacus. <laughs> They just put a grin on his pussy once in a while. He convinced me with one drawing to watch. Um, I, I didn't want. I had no desire to see that show. So it's a Batman show without Batman. And all of a sudden, everybody, all the characters, shoehorn into being in Gotham, you know. And then of course, Nighty little girl. And he did a drawing of uh, Penguin, which is the most promising character on that show. And we have the print at his table. He did that and the little cat girl. And I saw that, and I'm like, 
and I'm like, now I better watch the show. <laughs> yeah, I'm more Have you guys watched the show? Have you watched yes. yeah. the show? Favorite line from the show. Has anybody ever told you you walk like a penguin? <laughs> You know, within three minutes, that guy's going to be dead. <laughs> Great show. It's getting better. And it's just two shows, and it's good. Yeah. So I've kind of noticed ever since DC went to the new 52, uh -huh. that it seems like all the humor has been written out of the book. Yeah, right. The fun, Stupid. That, that, and, all the, and, the, and Marvel is singing with the humor. The, the, fun, the, the, the most humorous comic that I think DC now has out since they canceled Blackhawks was uh, is uh, World's Finest with Power Girl and Huntress. Uh -huh. That's the only one that seems to have any humor in it. Not Booster Gold? <laughs> I'm thinking about Booster a lot. Well, it was, kind of, it was kind of fun when he was in the, the New 52 Justice League International, but right. they killed that issue. That yeah. title. I never read even the old 52. <laughs> I have to show that I have not bought a comic book fresh off the shelf on a Wednesday in 10 years. Because every time I pick one up, I put it down there. There's no continuity. You would have a, um, a, a writer and an artist team on a, on, on a storyline, story arc. As soon as they leave, the next team would totally ignore what the other one did. But, uh, Artists would ignore the other artists' work, so there's no continuity. I don't know if it's the same character, what's going on. So what I do is I buy all the archives, all the essentials, the, all the trade paperback and the classic stuff that Neil did. You know, once in a while I'll find, you know, a couple of things here and there. I'll buy for the art, and you know, it just. It I will. I will suggest to, this that, yeah. that Marvel does have an editorial policy, and DC hasn't yet. Been. I mean, be consistent. Isn't that just a basic editorial policy? <laughs> yeah. Just you know, story one funny. issue to that. Unless there's somebody saying that, and as an, I respect Jim Lee tremendously as an artist, uh, and uh, what's his name? Uh, Dan DiDeo. Dan DiDeo. I respect uh, Dan DiDeo as a person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, as a person. <laughs> but I don't expect editor. <laughs> Editorial policy out of them, whereas Joe Casada, who left, what's his name in charge? Uh, Tom Reborn. Tom, no, not Tom Reborn, the other guys do or believe in the actual lines. So they do believe in editorial policy and they keep their characters fairly consistent and, and, and in continuity so they can build these big major story arcs. At DC, story arcs is like, what? Really a story arc? With what? I don't know. Let's do a story arc within 52. How? We don't have consistent characters. I don't even know if Aquaman still has two hands. Does he? Now he has. Now he's got, did he grow a hand back? <laughs> I, I want like a fish. Like a fish. I know dolphins who grow paddles back all the time. I want Blue Ring to be five foot three, hairy and angry, smoke a cigar, okay? <laughs> and and uh, I want costumes back. It's like you Does that say five minutes or yeah. dollar minutes? <laughs> five dollars. <laughs> uh, you know, I remember when the movies were trying to follow the comic, and now the comics are trying to follow the movies, and all these costumes, you know, all this realism. Like, you know, the, the new Bat Girl, she's just wearing a little leather jacket and sneakers. I don't want Bat Girl superhero to look like my neighbor's daughter when she goes to school. It's seriously, you know, it's like, what happened? Like, stop being so bloody apologetic about it. You're a freaking comic character, superhero. Put on a damn costume. Have bright and colorful, you know, stuff. I mean, I want to see that. And I'm tired of seeing these from taken from the headlines, you know, uh, this this story arc is inspired by this and that. No, I don't want reality in my comic book. I have enough of that, you know, outside. I want to see superhero fights, super villains, and have fun. Down. Go into adventure. I'm sorry. Where's the spring? So, so uh, this is what I suggest, okay? And listen, that, uh, I mean, you can have another question or two, but I say, since Joel has been doing the sexy girls, have him do superhero characters for you if you do a commission because they're gorgeous. Okay. Buzz can do anything. If you come down to my table, just buy Prince, okay, and ask me about Batman Odyssey. 
Because I do a great rant on Batman. <laughs> okay. Does anybody have any last one or two questions? Yes, right there. <coughs> I was just wondering, since you're back into comics, like I remember buying your books back in the 60s, and how much I enjoy your work on Dead Man. Am I going to do Dead Man again? This is possible. He's, He's dead, dead, I hear. Isn't he dead? Or a green arrow. A green somebody? Yeah. I don't know. So they'll, do, they'll make me do something. Whatever. <laughs> He's going to call I just, I, I, it, I intend it to be unexpected. Great Look, at, did you expect me to be doing Superman and New Gods? No. That's why I'm doing it. He's going to do My Little Pony. Yeah. <laughs> I hear Guillermo del Toro talk to you about doing Dead Man. Yeah, that's true. Big fan. Guillermo del Toro is a big fan of Nemo. Big question. Wouldn't it be great to have Guillermo del Toro do a Dead Man movie? Oh, yeah. That would be awesome. He had lunch with Arnold Drake a couple times. I know. He's trying. Very trying. Yes? Probably not enough time for this question to really play out, but. What's the biggest lesson from your advertising work, all three of you, that you brought to comics and vice versa? Well, well, well that's good. Okay. Uh, you guys want to try it? Uh, well, that brought into the comics, I, I, I haven't come back in any so right. bring, Bringing advertising, though, into just the career in general. And when I, when I came out to Los Angeles and started working in animation, one of the things that people loved about me was that I was fast. I can sit down and they give me a show and I can bang out it. I can bang out a show in no time. And I think a lot of that had to do with growing up in New York City and doing advertising there and what they call the New York Minute. You have to get something done really quickly in New York. So I came out to LA, and especially when I worked on the Incredible Hulk series, they would the director would just like stand over me and where, where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, what I go is finish the job and editors and art directors are assholes in both businesses. Okay, so so what what I learned, what I've learned in advertising is there's all kind of tech all kinds of techniques that you can use that aren't used in comic books that we have to bring to comic books. One of them is motion comics. You guys know anything about motion comics? Yeah. Okay, you should see. Did you see the one that we did called? Uh, what's it called? The X Men. Astonishing X Men. Yes. Yeah, but what's the title? Astonishing. Uh, oh, the gift. Gifted. Oh, okay. Called Gifted. Okay. Try to get to see Gifted, the motion comic. Uh, John Cassidy and uh, what's his name? Um, Whedon. 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 Josh Whedon and, and John Cassidy. We animated that. That's a terrific project for a motion comic, and it is an example of how motion comics should be done. The problem is, it costs too much money. It costs like uh, $350,000 for Marvel to do it. And they, time's up. Okay, this, I'm gonna take another minute or two. Uh, <laughs> sorry, breaking rules. Um, motion comics are part of the wave of the future just as graphic novels are. And I, when I say graphic novels, I'm talking about novels. I'm talking about 300 page or more books done in the comic book format. Because uh, stores don't want to sell uh, three, you know, we all go, a $3.99 comic book, that's too expensive. A $4.99 comic book, that's too expensive. But stores, stores want to sell a $29 book or a $39 book. So they, because they have so much, just so much space, and when you put all those comic books up there, they can't make a buck on it. They can make a buck on books. So bookstores know how to survive because they have higher priced books. There has to be some kind of a medium between higher priced books and lower priced books where you have a section of the store dedicated to comic books, not a very big section, and other, the, other, the rest of the books is those books that have graduated from comic books and turned into graphic novels because they can stay on the shelves for months and still sell and still be worth having in the store. Otherwise, we can't have comic book stores. So we have to understand that this is a business as well as a fan thing. So we can replenish the comic book area, but we have to have books that will last and people will keep on buying them over time because our population of readers is growing. So we need those novels. 
We need motion comics. We need other ways to present comics in formats that we haven't done before. You know that DC Comics is doing these 3D lenticular lens comic books, but they're not moving. They're doing little tricks with them. I'm gonna have on my graphic novel, Blood, a lenticular lens cover that not only is 3D, but is animated. And very soon, because we're putting it together right now and that whole thing is done. So we're, as soon as we can get it out, we're gonna put it out. But it's animated. Now imagine that. Now imagine this, which they're not gonna do for me because I'm like, they, nobody can catch up to what I do, okay? But <laughs> just to just let you know what I, the hope that I express, but I can't get it. What happens on that cover is the character blood turns and fires a gun, -da 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 -da, and bu bullets are flying at him, and this creature leaps at it, out of his chest at you, okay, in animation. But guns are firing. So what I want to have, and I'm not, I can't get it, but I know technologically, technologically it's available. If you could put in the corner a little disc about that big, about that big, right into the corner of the book, when you pick up the book and turn it, it makes gunfire, -da 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 -da, like that. So if you just press it like that and, go and pick it up like that, it'll be the gunfire on, that you see on the cover. I want to see that, okay? <laughs> Technologically, that's available. That's the kind of thing I want to see get done. All of these things are available. These are for our entertainment. This is an entertainment crazy culture that we're in and moving into, and we all want to have fun together. So I want to see that stuff happen. What did I learn in advertising? Catch their eye and entertain them. Catch their eye and entertain them. That's what advertising is all about. And that's what I want to do, and that's what I want our business to do. After we entertain them, and after we splash in their faces, give them a good book to read. That's what it's about, and that's what our future is about. And that's why comic books are so great, we're leaving the room now. <laughs>